This video was originally recorded February 2019 during the ongoing Force for Good class series. To learn more about this ongoing series, please visit TibetHouse.us. It is a microphone. <laughs> okay, so uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for coming. This is uh, actually the uh, inaugural session of this, uh, this year's Dalai Lama's Force for Good, in which there's an incredible lineup of speakers and teachers uh, discussing various themes, Buddhist themes, which should be great. Um, so, this, uh, this session, uh, as my students know, I really don't like to lecture. Uh, I like very much more uh, allowing a collective intelligence to come out because the intelligence in this room and the experience in this room is extraordinary in life. And if Buddhism has any relevance, it has to have relevance to life because here we are. So, so in, it, as this is the first session, and then there are two more coming up in two weeks and then another week. And, and I described it like this. Uh, in these three sessions, we'll explore experiential yoga, a path for deepening our engagement with Buddhist teachings, freeing ourselves from conceptuality and emotion, fostering dialogue, and moving toward enlightenment. Then, using this technique, we'll take a close look at time and reincarnation, further destabilizing our ordinary consciousness. Finally, we'll get on the quick path to Silicon Valley superintelligence. We'll explore how interpretation uh, can create reality as taught in Buddhist Tantra and quantum physics. What was I smoking when I wrote that? <laughs> okay, so, so first, let's... Uh, Let's, let's start, and, and it's wonderful, it's so wonderful always to be here. And by the way, this photography exhibit of Ladakh is really amazing. Uh, please, on your way out, uh, take a look at it. Um, and, and Buddha, in and, and getting back to the theme of not liking to lecture, you know, Buddha also said, do it yourself and rely upon your own experience. And Buddha also said, don't take it from me, just because I said so. And, I mean, I'm so far below Buddha that I could certainly say the same thing. So, instead of an orientation to this experiential yoga, um, an orientation, when you think about it, means pretty much do it my way, right? I'll orient you how you should think. So, let's start with a disorientation. Um, Anybody here of Paulo Freire? I know some of you have in class and in, in, in the Clementi course as well. Um, Paulo Freire talked about uh, the banking method of education. And, uh, and actually, you know, he's Brazilian and now his works are banned in Brazil under the latest you know, government. Yeah, Leticia, you told me that, right? And, uh, um, so he wrote as following about this method of education. He said, narration, with the teacher as narrator, leads the students to memorize mechanically the narrated account. Worse yet, it turns them into containers, into receptacles to be filled by the teacher. The more completely she fills the receptacles, the better a teacher she is, the more meekly the receptacles permit them to selves to be filled, the better students they are. Uh, and my students at Columbia often say, yeah, that's pretty much how it is, <laughs> right? Um, education thus becomes an act of depositing in which the students are deposit, the uh, students are the depositories and the teacher is the depositor, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, ironically though, as I'm reading this to you, uh, don't you feel like you're being banked? Right, I'm telling you how it is. 
It's a little irony there. So here's a, here's a, here's a question, and, and I take it that, and by the way, anybody at any point feel free to interrupt, to talk, because I'd like this to be a dialogue. Okay, Hannah? Okay. Interrupt, talk, you know, whatever you want to do is fine. It'll be better that way. So, so this, so Frere sounds good to you guys? Make sense? Right? It does. Very liberating, etc. So, I have a question for you. Does this apply to guru yoga? Um, which is a fundamental practice on the Buddhist path. Uh, right? It's so fundamental that in the, uh, in the Tibetan way of taking refuge, when we say, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha, Tibetans start with, I take refuge in the guru, in the Lama. Um, and so it's so fundamental, and uh, um, what is that in terms of Paulo Freire's uh, critique of depositing? Think about that, and you'll get no deposit from me on this one, uh, because Freire would be unhappy with that. And this is part of our disorientation. And I'll get into why we're doing that in a little bit. Um, famous story, there are two fish swimming, and one fish turns to the other fish and says, how's the water? And the other fish says, what water? That was made very famous by David Foster Wallace, the great writer in a, in a, in a uh, commencement speech he gave at Kenyon College. And, and we're in the water. Aren't we? We're constantly in the water of our own experience, of our own thoughts, our own reactions. And it's so hard to see it because it's so close to us. And this was the point of, of Foster Wallace's speech. And to see the water, maybe we need to get lost first. Uh, who gets lost anymore? With Google Maps, does anyone get lost anymore? I don't think so. When, uh, no, <laughs> you got lost? <laughs> okay. Uh, but I, I was flying with my grandson um, back to Los Angeles, and it was a long flight, and, uh, and I was making conversation, and I said, Theo, uh, how do you think the pilot found his way or her way all the way to this little landing strip uh, in Los Angeles, and he looked at me, he's three and a half, and he said, I think the pilot used Waze. <laughs> so, so, you know, sometimes, sometimes we say, when we get a little depressed or whatever it is, we say, I feel so lost. Anybody ever have that experience? Right, I feel so lost. Uh, that might not have any meaning in a, in a few years, right? Because kids growing up with all this, what do you mean loss? It doesn't make any sense. So, but think about this. Buddha, uh, Buddha got lost first. Buddha grew up in town, in the palace, with the family, with the teachers, with the harem. Uh, and, and before Buddha could learn anything, could break out of a, a cycle of kind of blindness, he had to get lost. And he, he really got lost. He went out for many years and wandered in the jungles, in the towns with different teachers, and totally got lost. Um, my, one of my favorite uh, Buddhist sutras is the uh, Fear and Dread Sutra the Bera Bhairava Sutra. And in that sutra, it describes how Buddha's talking to a bunch of, of monks. And, uh, and one monk says, hey, Buddha, what would happen if a monk was out in the jungle meditating and then he hears a twig break or something brushes up against him and he thinks to himself, could it be a tiger? Could it be a snake? 
And, uh, and Buddha listens, he says, well, funny thing, I, in one of my past lives, I was that monk. And I was out there meditating in the fearsome places, lost in the jungle, and, and I said, I heard those sounds, and I said to myself, sorry, <laughs> and I said to myself, could that be the fear and dread coming? Could it be a tiger? And then Buddha said, and so I thought to myself, did I do anything I have to regret in my life? No. My thoughts have been good, my conduct have been, has been good, uh, and on and on. And, uh, and, and so he said to himself, he tells the monks, if I feel the fear and dread and I'm sitting, I'm just going to keep sitting. I'm not going to change position until I overcome that fear and dread. And if I'm standing, and if I'm lying down, same deal. I'm not going to change my position. And, and then, having overcome that fear and dread, Buddha then, and only then, goes to the Bodhi tree after he meets that woman from the village who gives him some milk and sits down under the Bodhi tree and then becomes enlightened. Buddha had to get lost and then overcome his fear and anxiety before he could make any progress. So, so being lost is not so bad. Um, let's, uh, um, let's take a look at, at this as we continue our disorientation. I don't know if you can see this here. These are two selections. This is from the, um, the uh, Chunda Kamaraputta Sutta. I don't know if you can read that all the way back there, but I'll read it to you. Um, which means uh, Chunda, the, the silversmith. And, and in it, uh, there's a fairly uh, standard... Hi, Lisa. How are you? <laughs> uh, there's a fairly standard... Uh, rendition of Buddhist doctrine and it says the blessed one said there are three ways in which one is, is made impure by bodily action four ways in which one is made impure by verbal action and three ways in which one is made impure by mental action and how is one made impure in three ways by bodily action there's the case where a certain person takes life as a hunter bloody handed devoted to killing and slaying showing no mercy to living beings he takes what is not given. He takes in the manner of a thief things in the village or in the wilderness that belong to others and have not been given by them. He engages in sensual misconduct. He gets sexually involved with those who are protected by their mothers, their fathers, their brothers, their sisters, their relatives, or their dharma. And those with husbands, those with entail punishments, or even those crowned with flowers by another man. Uh, fooling around, that is. This is how one is made impure in three ways by bodily action, right? Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. Furthermore, as a result of being endowed with these ten courses of unskillful action, hell is declared, an animal womb is declared, rebirth in the realm of hungry ghosts is declared, that or any other bad destination. Hello, Gail. Okay, so, um, but then look at this. Very famous sutra, right? Be pure or you're going straight to the bad place, okay? And here's this one from the Guya Samaja Tantra, completely venerated by His Holiness, the Indo-Tibetan tradition. And it says in the Guya Samaja Tantra, those who are of low birth or who do despised work and those whose minds are bent on killing succeed in this supreme way. you imagine? The matchless Mahayana, even great evildoers, beings who have committed irrevocable sins, succeed in this way of the Buddhas. This great ocean of the Mahayana, that means great vehicle. Uh, uh, those who blame their teacher never succeed in sadhana, that means practice. But those who destroy life and delight in lying those who covet the wealth of others and are attached to sensual desires, those who eat excrement and urine, all these are worthy of the practice. 
The sadhaka, that's the practitioner who desires his mother, sister, and daughter attains entire siddhi, accomplishment. The dharma nature of the supreme Mahayana, enjoying the mother of the Lord Buddha, he is not defiled, but that wise one, free from dualistic thought, attains the Buddha nature. Uh, contradiction? Yeah. yeah, okay. So what? <laughs> what? I mean, really? Now, of course, you know, you know that there's tons of literature reconciling these things. But what? Um, so what do we do with this? Do we say life is inconsistent? What do you do with a parent, a spouse, or a partner who's sometimes loving and sometimes not? You always are. <laughs> um, sometimes not, or even abusive, right? How do you interpret your experience with them? What about your very own self? Uh, why do you sometimes feel great and sometimes feel terrible? Um, who are you? What about your own mind? Why is it sometimes clear and sometimes confused? What about your life? Why do we feel immortal? Don't we all feel immortal right now? Knowing full well that we have to die. So, is it any surprise that Buddha's teachings might be like life? But it's crazy. Buddha's teachings seem as contradictory as, as, as everything in life is. It's really not fair. Physicists are trying to construct a theory of everything. And the latest thing they're doing is trying to reconcile uh, quantum mechanics and gravity, um, no success yet. And actually, Stephen Hawking, the late Stephen Hawking, uh, didn't think that they would find one. No theory of everything. Don't we want a theory of everything? I do. Um, but maybe not. Think, think of a goldfish or a bunch of goldfish that are in a, in a curved bowl, right? And, and looking out through the glass in the curved bowl, they get this completely crazy distortion, right? I think there's actually a town in Italy that made it illegal to keep goldfish in a curved bowl <laughs> for that reason. But, but is it cruel to keep them in a curved bowl with that distorted view of reality? There are so many questions and, and so few answers. Maybe no answers. It reminds me of a recurrent dream I had when I was a boy. And I was falling into a vortex, a dark vortex, uh, through dark space. This is falling. Are we a little disoriented? A little disoriented? A little bit? Okay, good. Um, <laughs> now, there's several ways of looking at this disorientation which is one of the fundamental conditions of life. Um, one way, if we're trying to hold on to some sense of order, then it's very upsetting. Does anyone remember that movie, High Anxiety, that Mel Brooks movie? <laughs> Kay does. Okay. <laughs> where, where you see in the beginning of the movie, you see this like vortex thing, and there's Mel Brooks. He's going, ah! <laughs> Well, if you're trying, if this disorientation can be very upsetting if you're trying to hold on to something. Um, on the other hand, if we just kind of go into that vortex, into that space, um, we can have a more spacious experience. If we just let go uh, with our minds, uh, we can expand them and take into account this crazy huge vortex, inconsistent all kinds of things popping up that don't make sense. It's okay. Um, and you could imagine that asking these questions ourselves is a way of purifying our own minds because, because we're always right, stuck in our, in our thought patterns. You know, like I never met a rut I didn't want to go back to. So I constantly want to go back. But, but you could see that this constant, this questioning and this, this disorientation and falling can be that sense of 
purification. And that's one way, actually, to prepare for a Buddhist teaching. Traditionally, you prepare the, the space that we're in. We don't have to prepare this space at all. It's beautiful. Um, but also, you want to also, also prepare your mind. Um, and, and so we can take, take refuge in the Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. I mean, obviously, you don't have to. Um, uh, you can take refuge in, in something else. I, I think of it as, as a... Uh, like I'm in a city that I've never been in, and it's cold, and it's rainy, and uh, it starts to rain harder. And I look across the street, and there's a bar, and there are a bunch of people in it. And it looks like a nice place. It looks warm. They're eating. They're laughing. So I'm going to go check that out. It's better than staying out in the rain. So, so I would say that, so let's say it together if you want. Just I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. And then we'll get lost some more. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. Dharma just means Buddhist teachings. And Sangha means the Buddhist community. Um, so, okay, so let's, let's look at this. Okay, now, um, what is it? Anybody? Quack, quack? Okay, anybody else? What is it? Two legs and a belly button. Two legs and a belly button. <laughs> What else? Rabbit. What else? House. A house. Okay. What do you see? Soren? Wittgenstein's favorite thought problem. Wittgenstein's favorite thought problem. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Okay. A horse is behind. A horse is behind. Yeah. Um, yeah, maybe a beaker. A beaker. He held up like that. I mean, you can go on. Right now, now. Now, with each of those, as you come up with that, you just be aware how your mind gets it like that. That your mind, you, you, you go to a little place in your water nearby, and then thought comes, whatever thought, and there it is. Um, and it could be all of these things, a broken tennis racket. Now, it also could be, Abstract gray lines on a white background, right? Uh, white, a white painted on a gray background, right? It could be that. Um, foam core, teaching material, uh, a visual sense object, ecstasy, atoms and molecules, a wave function, a mathematical function, probabilities in the quantum sense, um, statistical function, emptiness, Buddhist emptiness, uh, time. Uh, we'll get into time in the next session, but you know, Dogen said, the Zen master Dogen said, time is a giant golden Buddha. Well, why shouldn't this be time also? So, so, are any of these right, by the way? Um, can it mean all of these? All these things? Everyone? Even, uh, you know, some butt of some animal? No? Um, now, notice how your take on it uh, depends on and changes with your conception of it. Right? So, if you're looking at it, and you're thinking, foam core. And you're looking at it, and you're thinking, Wittgenstein. Because, in, in, in truth, the, the uh, great philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein uh, made this famous in his philosophical investigations. Right? He says, he writes, I should not have answered the question, what do you see here, by saying, now I am seeing it as a picture rabbit. 
I should simply have described my perception just as if I had said, I see a red circle over there. Nevertheless, someone else, see, this is what's wrong with philosophers. Uh, nevertheless, someone else could have said of me, he is seeing the figure as a picture rabbit. It would have made as little sense for me to say, now I am seeing it as, as to say at the side of a knife and a fork, now I am seeing this as a knife and a fork. I mean, who says that, right? It's not what people do. Um, so Wittgenstein so it goes for ordinary language versus you know, all this philosophical speculation. But do we care what Wittgenstein thinks? Really, no, it's quite, some people say no, most, a lot of people say no, right? So we don't care what he thinks. But yet, Soren does care what he thinks, right? So, so does it matter what the creator's or the author's intention was? What do you think? In terms of figuring out what things are. By the way, everybody, this applies to everything. This applies to looking at each other right now. Does it matter what the author's intent was? Now, there's a long tradition of this, and back in the 1700s, Friedrich Schleiermacher, who was a biblical scholar, um, he said that really what you want to do in understanding, he's talking about texts mainly, is you want to understand it better than the author. So you want to delve into it, know everything about it, and then understand it better than the author. But then, more recently, Roland Barthes, uh, he wrote his famous article, The Death of the Author. He said the author is dead. It doesn't matter what the author thinks. So what are we supposed to do with that? Now, let's look at another thing. We're still being disoriented. I mean, I'm, is it, are you disoriented? Yeah, okay, getting there, okay. So, let's look at this. Okay, so what is this? Let's go. What do we think this is? Iron. Bookend. What? Ancient. Okay. Okay. Piece of metal. Piece of metal. Door handle. Okay. Um, picture. Um, foam core. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> right, all, all the above. Or what about if, if you happen to walk into the room really ticked off at somebody? Murder weapon. <laughs> um, you know, again, all, but, but how, you know, all these, some of these, and what do, we, what, do we, what do we do? Do we look at the function of it to decide what it is and what it means? Right? It's actually, this is or I made famous by the uh, cognitive scientist Daniel Dennett who wrote about this thing. It's actually called a sad iron. Anybody ever hear of a sad iron? It's actually, they used to fill it up with water and iron, but now nobody uses it like that anymore. And it's mostly bookends and decoration. Just like the old computers, the really big ones that used to fill up whole rooms, are basically good just to anchor boats now. <laughs> right. And for nothing else. And so, and so Dennett said, the way you figure out what something is or what it means are the, is, is the function of it, right? You'd look at the function in the present, the function in the past, and you'd, and you'd figure out what it is then. So I have a question. Okay, that sounds pretty good. Intent of the author, maybe not, the author is dead. And by the way, these are the main ways that in the West, in our culture, we've tried to figure out what things mean and what they are. So um, do people have functions? Right? Um, now, I'll leave that out there. Uh, now, what about, what would this look like to a bat? What would this look like to a bat? You know, bats just sense everything by radar. Um, what would it look like? It would look, wouldn't look like this 
to a bat. And, 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 and actually, there's a very famous essay by the philosopher Thomas Nagel called what, would, what, <laughs> what Is It Like to Be a Bat? in which Nagel looked at this question, the incredible variance of perception that there is among people and among animals, etc. And, 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 and he, he wrote that, quote, philosophers share the general human weakness for explanations of what is incomprehensible in terms suited for what is familiar and well understood, though completely different, right? So we're seeing something, you know, we don't know what it is, but, but yet we immediately look at it in terms of things that are familiar. That's our water. That's the water we're in. One fish said to the other fish, how's the water? What water? Well, it was starting to see the water. We're constantly surrounded by this, by this water. Now, now if, we, uh, if we only know our own point of view, then, uh, and, and that's familiar and well understood, then how do we know what it's like to be ourselves? If we only have one view and no kind of perspective. And that, of course, is how most of us go through every day, constantly. Our reactive one point of view without thinking about other points of view. And when you think about it, if you only have one point of view, you're only doing one thing, how can you possibly ever have perspective? You can't. Let's look at this one. This is from the Mahaparinibbana Sutra, um, and it describes the Four Noble Truths. The Four Noble Truths are key to Buddhism. This is what Buddha realized under the Bodhi tree, right? And, and it says bhikkhus, that means monks, it is through not realizing, through not penetrating the Four Noble Truths that this long course of birth and death has been passed through and undergone by me as well as you. What are these four? They are the noble truth of suffering, the noble truth of the origin of suffering, the noble truth of the cessation of suffering, and the noble truth of the way to the cessation of suffering. But now, bhikkhus, that these have been realized and penetrated, cut off is the craving for existence, destroyed is that which leads to renewed becoming, and there is no fresh becoming. In other words, nirvana, the extinguishment of that desire, and, and a state where we don't have to keep cycling through suffering over and over again. Very famous sutra. Four Noble Truths, uh, according to Dalai Lama, according to just about everybody, this is the essence of Buddhism. Now, here's the Heart Sutra. The Heart Sutra is probably the most recited sutra in all of Buddhism. Uh, and the Heart Sutra says, there is no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind. There is no form, no sound, no smell, no taste, no texture, no phenomenon. There is also no eye element and so on, up to no mind element, and also up to no element of mental awareness. There is no ignorance and no elimination of ignorance and so on up to no aging and death and no elimination of aging and death. Likewise, there is no suffering, origin, cessation, or path. The Four Noble Truths. There's no Four Noble Truths. Likewise, uh, there is no wisdom, no attainment, and even no non-attainment. Completely contradictory. Um, how do we reconcile them. What methods should we use? Should we use Indo-Tibetan methods of interpretation or should we use Western principles or a blend or something else? Now, if you're here um, and come, came to Tibet House, then you could also uh, have some expectations about this. It's part of our water that we bring. And so, you might be what we call a model reader for this text. And a model reader, according to Umberto Eco, famous Italian 
uh, uh, writer, he says, the modern reader is somebody who comes to it just like when you're telling a fairy tale, right? You say, once upon a time. And you're inviting the listener who's a child or someone like a child to enter into a suspension of disbelief and go with you, right? So in many ways, this is another way that we can look at some of this, some of this literature that we're looking at. Um, so we have these contradictions, and then, of course, we look before at the at Chunda the silversmith, and we have the Guya Samaja with the only killers and those who have sex with their mothers and daughters and married people. They're the only ones who can become enlightened. So this is very strange indeed. And of course, uh, we have this in every religious tradition. We have these contradictions which don't seem to make much sense. So how, how, oh, let me show you one more. I'll show you one more, okay. Um, this is a song it's found in an old book of songs uh, by Virupa. One is the liquor girl. She enters into two houses. She doesn't have yeast or bark. She produces liquor, making it firm, free from old age and death. The body becomes incorruptible. Having seen at the tenth door, the buyer has come. He himself has brought in 64 pots. Is it, how many bottles of beer are there in the wall? I think it's 64. Yeah, it's, is it 64? 99. 99, okay, all right. In the 64, it would be, okay. Uh, in the 64 pots, the display is arranged, the buyer is entered, but there is no egress. Okay, so uh, it's a drinking song, of course. And, um, but this is how it's, it's interpreted in the Buddhist tradition. And it's interpreted like this. One is the liquor girl, that's the central channel. Yet she enters, causes to enter the central channel, two houses, the side channels. She produces, bind, binds by means of the clear light. Liquor, that means bodhicitta, essence, uh, fluid in the body, in the aperture of the peak of the Vajra jewel, um, and, and, and so on. A, an interpretation of this, uh, this could be a drinking song, right, as being the most profound kind of a tantric commentary. And, and, uh, and actually, uh, a very great authority, on, a, a scholar on Buddhist practices, Ron, Ron Davidson, actually he argues, this is really a drinking song, this is crazy. <laughs> right? And he's a translator, and, and uh, uh, so, so, again, we have completely different interpretations of the same thing. Now, how did you decide what these things are and what they mean when we looked at the sad iron and the duck rabbit? Um, I think you used, we all used, our elements of understanding, right? What are they? Sensory, biological, cultural, psychological, and conceptual. And here's the thing. We're doing this all the time. We're doing it right now. Okay, now, do you think that based upon, I'll ask you, based upon your sensory, biological, cultural, conceptual uh, uh, perception, Tracy, do you think that what you see is, is pretty accurate? No, okay. Okay, you're, in, you're still in the vortex. Okay, that's good. That's good because in fact, in fact, you know, let's start with the senses. Our senses are incredibly limited. We see uh, and with our human eyes, they're capable of perceiving only wavelengths between 390 and 750 nanometers. It's really, really small. That is, our eyes can only see like point thirteen zeros three five percent of what there is out there, right? So that if if you had, imagine there were six billion people on Earth and there were two million Earths, right? 
and you were looking at all that stuff, you would only see 42 people, right? So we hardly see anything. And, and in fact, uh, the physicist Carlo Rovelli, who writes really great books, uh, intelligible to you know, normal people uh, on these things, he talks about time not existing, but only existing as the blurring of our vision because of the way our vision and understanding is correct and otherwise doesn't exist, right? Because the way we're constructed, we have a vision that includes entropy, the universe becoming more disordered, and that's the only thing that creates time. It was just a blurring or a narrowing that gives us that perception also, a perception of time that's like the bat, right? So, uh, cultural, right? There was a, an experiment where they invited 57 wine experts, experts in wine. And you know wine experts. Nobody's more of an expert than a wine expert. Uh, <laughs> and and, and they, gave them, they gave them each, um, they gave half of them one wine, or half of them the white wine, and half of them the white wine that just had food coloring in it. And all of the experts who tasted the red wine, which was really white wine, described it in terms that they always described red wine in. It has this kind of bouquet, it has this, it has that. Um, even, so even the experts were stumped by that. Um, then, you know, think about, you know, here, we do this, right? You like something on Facebook? It's like this. That's not very good in some other cultures. That means something very bad in other cultures. Then, um, they did experiments on showing people from, uh, from the West uh, compared with Asian people in terms of a, uh, a photograph with one central thing in the middle and, and a lot of things in the background. And they found consistently and overwhelmingly that the people who were brought up on this side would focus on the thing in the middle but and, and not really anything else that was happening. Whereas people from Asia, uh, statistically, you know, very significant amount of them focused on what was behind, right? Um, blue is for boys, pink is for girls. In the 1920s, it was the opposite, right? Just a cultural Thing, just a, a meme, uh, something that happens. So, so we have all of these limitations culturally and with our senses, psychologically, of course. We know what happens when we're, we're angry or confused or have emotions, how that completely alters what we see. And then conceptually, right, there was a time when slaves were not people. Now, animals are not people. That may change dramatically. Who knows? But this, so we're so, we're so bound to this, and it doesn't, so we see so little, and it's so arbitrary. Evolutionary biologists say that basically what we're perceiving now has nothing to do with what's really, quote unquote, out there. That it's only in order to give us evolutionary fitness in order to reprodu reproduce and survive. It's like, for example, when you look at your computer screen and you see a little folder, right? The folder's got nothing to do with what's in the computer, right? Not to do with the hardware, not to do with anything else. It's a simple representation. That's what we all are. We're just little representations. So, So let's, let's bring it, let's make it real now. Uh, let's take a look at, this is an awkward room maybe. Let's take a look at, can everybody see the back of this? Well, let's, hmm. Look at a chair. Look at the corner of a chair near you. Okay, one way or another, look at that. And um, let's, let's do it. Look. <clears throat> and 
And, and as we look, let's be aware of what we're bringing to it. So I'm looking at the chair, let's look at the chair and be aware now of what you're bringing to it. Are you bringing stuff? Right. Are you bringing stuff that's got nothing to do with anything? Are you bringing stuff that's, you know, wide of the mark? I mean, are you, I know I am. Um, and now, now, this is, the stuff that we bring is our water. This is the water we're in. It's the water we're in in this moment. And a lot of it is the water we just carry around, right? Everything from the, the shape of this part of the chair to, um, to the feeling I have in my body looking at this chair um, to the awareness of you all looking at me, looking at the chair. Oh my God, it's just so much stuff. And, and yet we are hardly ever aware of it from minute to minute. We're walking around in this incredible cocoon, this, this aqueous cocoon, and we're not aware of any of it. Now, let's do something a little scary, but I promise you it won't be too long. Let's look at another person and see what we bring to looking at the other person. Okay, let's go. <laughs> I promise it won't go on too long. Okay, just, just be aware of what you're bringing to it. Because after all, it's just an image, right? Right? Are, are, we, bring, are, do we, bring, are we bringing stuff? Oh my, Is, was it more than the chair? More than the chair. Okay, actually... That's, that's how come we're all here. Okay. Now, now let's, now, now let's, let's, let's turn the gaze, let's turn the gaze on ourselves. Right now, it's hard to look at yourselves because you can't turn your eyes around like that. But just, you know, just put your awareness on yourself now, your body and mind. And uh, let's experience that. Now, is it more stuff or less stuff than the chair? What do you think? More? What about looking at the other person? Okay, but, I mean, how often do you look at yourselves like that? Never, right? Rarely, rarely. It's no wonder shrinks make so much money. <laughs> because it's such a novel experience for us to do that. Um, you know, so... So, you know, what are you? Are you just an image in your mind? Are you an animal, a body, real projection, a drawing, a robot, right? A mother, a daughter, a niece, um, a collection of the five aggregates, a hundred trillion cells. And what is your understanding of yourself as you look at yourself? What is it based upon? you know, biologically, culturally, psychologically, conceptually. Um, so, so if our interpretation of these things, objects, other people, ourselves, is
based upon this random collection of sensory, biological, psychological, and other factors, how can we think it is accurate? Or what are the chances that it's accurate? What is it, like one in a gazillion? Um, um, how can we ever get beyond this, this collection of limiting prisms through which we see everything? Um, now, what about the Buddhist view of uh, how we perceive and understand things? Does that save us? This is where I should start preaching. But I won't, because we're still in disorientation. Uh, the Buddhist view, actually, is that unless we're enlightened, that our understanding is ignorant, which is caused by our desire and our anger, or our attachment and aversion. Um, so even if we had some understandings, looking at it as the Buddhist way now, how could it be accurate, right? But even our understanding of what the Buddhist way is, that's mired in ignorance too. Oh my goodness, we're still in the vortex. Um, so really, there's nowhere to stand, okay? Nowhere to stand. And so the question is, you know, where do we start? We've cleaned the slate a little bit, just a little. Um, so where do we start? And what is the time? Eight o'clock, not bad, okay. Um, so we start, and we've done it already, in the Buddhist way, by taking refuge. And this is, we need this to counter the disorientation, because, face it, it's no way to go through life like, ah, like that. You don't want to do it. Um, but then we need the disorientation at the same time to counter our taking refuge and not make it some piece of dogma, right? So here's the problem. Um, and, 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 and Wallace ended his speech on the water. He said... Uh, it is about simple awareness, awareness of what is so real and essential, so hidden in plain sight all around us, that we have to keep reminding ourselves over and over, this is water, this is water. And he said it's unimaginably hard to do this, to stay conscious and alive day in and day out. Um, he figured out, I think, the first part of the problem, um, and that this is, a, and this is our predicament. We're in the water of our and biases, um, and being aware of that is first step. I think we've got some awareness of that. Um, um, and it's asking a lot of us to figure out by ourselves a way out, um, and that's where the Buddhist path really does come in. Um, maybe it's not so hard. Maybe it's so hard that hardly anybody could do it. But uh, here's, here's a little preview of how, uh, of how we can climb out of the vortex. So where we were is we're unaware of, or not so aware of, the water that we're in. We become more aware of the water through mindfully contemplating the fan, or other people, or ourselves. It's a good little exercise. Why am I? reacting to this the way I am. And we start to appreciate the fact that the water, our water, has little or no relationship to what we thought of as reality. And we feel lost and we wonder where to start. So, so now let's take a look at, at both Western and Buddhist answers to what we do about this problem. And uh, um, being in this situation this situation of interpreting our own experience from within our own experience, because that's the only place we could be, right, uh, has come to be called uh, the hermeneutic circle. Uh, hermeneutics. Um, sometimes I give a course at Columbia that has hermeneutics in the title, and the first thing I do is 
tell the students, congratulations, you took a course with the word hermeneutics in the title, you must be crazy or very brave. Okay, but hermeneutics really, it comes from the, the, the Greek god Hermes. And Hermes was, remember what Hermes did, Lisa? Messenger of the gods, right? So, so Hermes would come from you know, the god realm and tell the people what the gods were up to. And, um, and so for a while, for many, many thousands of years, hermeneutics was thought about only really in terms of interpreting scripture because you read the Bible or other scriptures and there are contradictions. So biblical scholars would take a lot of time in figuring out how we can re reconcile these. And it also was very important in terms of law uh, because we might have a statute and then we have to interpret whether the statute applies to a certain uh, course of conduct or not. And, uh, um, and, and, and so it was like that until the 20th century when things started to change, when, when thinkers like Martin Heidegger and Hans George Gadamer started applying this sort of notion of hermeneutics interpretation, not just to texts, not just to writing, but to all experience that basically what we were doing is translating and reconciling all experience like it was a text that we were trying to understand. And the idea is this, that we're all in what they called the hermeneutic circle. That is, we understand everything in terms of the circle of our own prior experience. Makes sense. It's like the circle of life, except it's right, the circle of life, and it's, but it's all within our experience. And when we experience something new, our circle changes, right? And, uh, and Gall Gadamer called this a fusion of horizons. He's thinking about when you learn something from how people did something in the past, and then you look at how it is in the present, and you fuse those horizons of time, and you, you, you change your preconceptions and biases. I like to think of it as more of a helix, where through dialogue and experience, we might be here, here, where you know, I think of everything in terms of, and then just fill in the blanks for yourself. Uh, you know, I don't want to even get too personal about this because I'd be embarrassed. But you just think everything in terms of, you know, your particular worldview, right? But then you meet somebody new and different. You have a conversation, you get close to them, and you change your mind a little bit. You see things a little bit different. So all of a sudden, your experience is now different, and when you interpret things, it's a little bit different. Meet somebody else, meet somebody else, and the way I look at it is you kind of go up in your understanding. So it's like a helix. Chan. So maybe you, like, get higher over time? Like, can you fall back down? Is there, like, a better... Wow. Better yeah, I think you could probably fall back down. In fact, it sounds like, it sounds like Candyland, the game. <laughs> Because you can get almost there to, to Candyland and then you pick that card and you're down. Or, or shoots and ladders. Same thing. So, uh, so, so, um, so what that says, what, what, what our Western tradition and all the philosophers following that says, is okay to start where you are because it's the only place you can start. But you can alter your experience by taking in different things. And actually, people have been uh, losing themselves like this throughout history. Um, as some of you had to read Descartes' Meditations, bring back nightmares. Uh, um, he, he, he starts out his meditations. He says, yesterday's meditation has thrown me into such doubts that I can no longer ignore them. Yet I fail to see how they can be resolved. It is as if I had suddenly fallen into a deep whirlpool. I am so tossed about that I can never touch bottom with my foot, nor swim up to the top. And so he, he didn't even know if he really existed. He finally figured out that he's a thinking thing. He said, I think, therefore I am. And we've been paying the price ever since. <laughs> because he could have said, we think, therefore we are. Right? And you know, he said, I think, therefore I am. We just read this in Clementi. And therefore, he says, I don't know if you all are robots. I may be making you up. He could have also said, we feel, therefore we are. Right? But he went, I think, therefore I am. He was paving the way for science. Science did a lot of good things for us. Science 
uh, and our excess are destroying the planet now. So uh, uh, he was in his own hermeneutic helix, and we're in, we're in ours. He did do a lot for us, though. Now, the Buddhist approach uh, is the same in terms of starting where we are. And, and, and this is explicit in Buddha's teachings because Buddha was very big on what he called skillful means, uh, upaya, which, and probably the most famous example of this is the, in the Lotus Sutra, the parable of the burning house, which many of you may have heard. And what happens, Buddha tells the story of this, there's, there's a, a man and, uh, and in, the, in the house are all his sons. Now, of course, there's not a daughter in there, they're all sons. That was their hermeneutic back then, very misogynist. Uh, anyway, so there's a fire in the house and, and uh, the man tells the kids, come out of the house, but they're playing with their toys and nobody wants to leave the house. So finally, after trying to get the kids out of the burning house, the man says, I've got the greatest toys out here. You can have a cart with a white bull pulling it. I guess that was, you know, Xbox back then. And, <laughs> and, and so the kids come out of the house. And that shows that, you know, and, and they asked Buddha, well, was that was a lie? Was that wrong? And Buddha said, no, that was skillful means. He had to save those kids, right? And uh, uh, in a way, uh, are we like those kids? I think pretty much. Uh, our first thought is, how will it affect me, right? Will I get some toys, right? Um, right, my witness to this is sitting right here. Uh, Jan, okay. <laughs> um, I'm not saying that's a bad thing. Um, uh, that can be a good thing, that's how we survive. Um, without surviving, we couldn't help anybody. So another example of this notion in Buddhism, how we have to start where we are, is the famous uh, example of, of, of how the glass of water looks to a hungry ghost and a god. To us, it's a glass of water. To a hungry ghost, who are these poor people who are so greedy in their past lives that they're reborn with tiny, tiny, thin throats and huge stomachs, and they're hungry all the time, and they can't get any food down their gullet, and they're just in agony because of it. To a hungry ghost, that glass of water looks like pus, and actually is pus. And to a god, that glass, what looks like a glass of water to us, is nectar, the nectar of the gods. And so this is another way that shows how, in the Buddha's teachings, the nature of the student, the nature of the student was, was really paramount. That you have to teach people where they are. In fact, you could argue that all of Buddha's teachings are just medicine. They're all just skillful means, not a doctrine to be found anywhere. And in fact, you have in, uh, and the, the, in Asia, the most, one of the most important sutras is the Medicine Buddha Sutra, which is all about Buddha as doctor. And there's the famous parable of the, of, the, of the arrow, the man wounded by an arrow who runs into the doctor, and the doctor wants to treat him, and the man says, first, I want to know who, shoot the, who shot the arrow. I want to know what his name was, who his parents were, where he lives, what his profession was, before you can treat me. And the doctor says, you want to live or die, right? So those things are not important. What's important is the practicality of the situation. So why are these things so important in Buddhism? It could be that it's that Buddha had his enlightenment experience when he was around 30, 35, and then lived for another 40 years and preached. And he preached to all kinds of people, all walks of life. And he had to be a really, really good teacher and know how to reach any kind of student. And so, actually, my, my, my favorite skillful means story is the story of Buddha's younger brother. You guys know Buddha had a younger brother? 
Think it was easy to be Buddha's younger brother? <laughs> I mean, can you imagine being Buddha's younger brother? Anyway, his name, his name was Nanda. And, uh, and, and he fell and fell. Well, <laughs> Don't put your hand I can't do that. Don't put, your hand Don't put my hand there. Okay. Is, it, is it okay now? Yes. Yeah. Maybe I better go like this. No, no, no. Just leave it there. Just leave it there. Okay. Okay. So, and, and, and Nanda fell in love with this beautiful girl named Soundara. And, uh, and they have an Ashvagosha who lived in the first century wrote uh, in Sanskrit the beautiful poetry description of their lovemaking and the incredible love they had for each other. And they really knew how to write that stuff back then. Anyway, so, but, but here, but here, then his, his older brother becomes Buddha. And Nanda's there in the palace with Sandara, where they hardly ever go out of the bedroom. And, and Nanda's starting to feel bad. He says, my older brother's Buddha. I should become a monk. It's about the last thing he wants to do. But, but eventually, he's so, he feels so ashamed that he goes and he becomes a monk and he leaves Sandara. And, uh, 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 and, and he's a monk for a little while and then he can't do it anymore. And he's about to go home to Sandara and he meets with Buddha and tells him that. And Buddha says, well, do you know that in heaven there are these incredible goddesses called Apsaras? They make your wife, your wife Sandara look like a dog. And so if you are a good monk, you can uh, have them when you go on to your next life. And so Nanda then, oh, he goes back and he's the best monk. Anyway, he's sitting around one day and a bunch of the other monks come in and, uh, and, and they can't take it anymore. And one of them, I think it's Ananda, who's Buddha's cousin, he's just laughing, goes over to Nanda and he says, is it true what they say? That you think that, you, and you're becoming a, you're a monk because you think when you die you're gonna have these goddesses? And, uh, and then Nanda says, well, uh, and he's ashamed and everything. And then he goes to Buddha and he says, look, I, I, I became a monk because of this. It's ridiculous, I know, but now I want to really find out what it is to be a monk. So anyway, so this is, this is another, uh, another use of this skillful means, right? To put somebody on the right path. We can argue about whether it was the right path, but put somebody on the right path, um, even if you're telling little white lies uh, sometimes. So, so how, so we, we start where we are, we have to use skillful means, so we, we want to see our water, how, what are some techniques that we can use to do this? Now, I'm going to talk about a few of them. I'm going to talk about uh, some techniques of the great seal, that is Mahamudra, a system of meditation. Um, I'll talk about uh, uh, the death process and what that can do for us, about the royal road to rel relativity, meditation, and uh, if we have time, I'll use another technique, the how much technique. Um, but I'll start with, uh, with the cat boxes. Does anyone have cats? Anyone have cats? Cat, cat people? It's different with dogs, okay? Um, <laughs> But uh, when uh, there are two kinds of obscurations that the Buddhists say we have to overcome in order to make progress. There are emotional obscurations, right? We know what those are, you know, hatred, we're getting upset about this, desire, etc. And our cognitive obscurations, we have to overcome uh, both of those. So when I clean the cat boxes, which is my job, and we have four cats, so it's a big job. Uh, does that cross the line, by the way? How many do you have to have before you become like, you know, a crazy cat man? Is it three? Is four okay? Uh, eight, maybe, okay. So anyway, so, 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 and, uh, and, and Theo knows this, when we scoop the large 
um, the excrement, that is clearing away our emotional obscurations. And when we clean the clumps of urine, clumped together in the cat litter, that is our cognitive obscurations. I, he's crazy, my wife just said. Okay, so, so <laughs> actually, and actually, actually, Joms Paul, who, uh, Lozong Joms Paul, who's my really main teacher, wonderful, wonderful man, who's actually from Ladakh, so all of this is where Joms Paul is from. He thought it was pretty funny, too, and he wrote a little article on the Tibetan newspaper about this crazy householder who did this thing. Um, anyway, okay, let's get serious. So, so here's, an, here's another thing, which will bring us to the heart of Buddhist doctrine, and that is, when I look at you, look at each of you, um, and feel you, and feel love for you, even if I don't know you, um, uh, I don't react to you in the same way. It changes things. Um, my reaction is no longer just my reaction. My water has changed a little bit. And... Uh, uh, I think my dad said it best. He said, what you love, you understand. And I think there's some truth to that. It changes your understanding. So when we experience something with empathy or love, um, uh, we see how it changes. It changes the world, just that little thing. And even if you, if you, don't, if you don't know someone and you look at them, you say, well, what's it like to be that person, right? And you feel some human sympathy. And just be aware of how that changes your water, right? And, and this gets us to the heart of Buddhism, which they call wisdom, compassion, inseparable. Um, now, Buddha said that ignorance, right, arising from attachment and aversion is, is the fundamental problem we have. And wisdom is knowing, in a way, that everything is not overdone and isolated, but rather is interconnected. And Thich Nhat Hanh, uh, who we should send good thoughts to, he's, I think, at the end of his life now in Vietnam, uh, he said that Instead of saying we are or we exist, he said we inter are, right? We inter exist. And the way I like to think about it is that um, rather than being David with a capital D, right? Sort of kingly, separate, um, just David with a small d, right? <laughs> Connected, not overdone and not underdone. And, and if I'm David with a small d, then I'm over myself a little bit. I have more of a capability of connecting, of seeing you, of seeing the world, and I'm less caught up in myself. And actually, it's much more fun being a relative David, with a small d, than being this exaggerated David, that way, with a relative David, you can hang out, right? Um, and, and, and once you're not yourself with the capital, you know, A, B, C, D, whoever, whatever your name starts with, then you can feel closer to people and things. And that's why wisdom, which they call the wisdom of emptiness, emptiness of what? Emptiness of overdoing things, mainly, although you can underdo things, too, by saying, like, I'm nothing, I'm nothing, I'm nothing. That's no good either. But, but the wisdom of emptiness is the same thing and leads directly to compassion because we're out of our way. And the same way compassion or love might start a little bit awkwardly, it's friendship and opening yourself to thinking about that other person, that leads to your taking down that capital letter in front of your name and making it a smaller letter. So they both go to the same place. Now, let's look at some, some other Buddhist tools. Now, Mahamudra that I mentioned is a uh, venerated, deep as the ocean, 
system of meditation. And occasionally, we give courses on Mahamudra here at Tibet House. And the important thing is to find a good teacher in this because it's all about experience. But I'm not, you know, I'm not that person, but I can talk a little bit about how we might just, just use this system just a little bit. So, so the way in the Mahamudra system uh, we look at mind is we look at mind as just, we call it, mere clarity and awareness. That's all it is. Mere clarity. That is, there's nothing obscuring it. It's not identical to what we're taking in. It's just merely clarity. And it's aware. It didn't fall asleep. It didn't wander all the way here and all the way there. But it's mere clarity and awareness. And, uh, and, and what's cool about this is if we focus on our minds being like this, it gives us a little chance to see the water. To see the water that we're in. And, and so, so let's think like this. Imagine that we're in a dark room and we want to see something and we have a flashlight. Uh, and we shine the flashlight on whatever the object is that we want to see. Well, there are three things going on. There's the person holding the flashlight, that's you. There's the flashlight itself, the light. And then there's the object that's illuminated by the flashlight. And so let's usually, when we look at things, like look at, let's look at the uh, part of the chair again. Um, when we look at it, let's look at it as if we're holding a flashlight. We're aware of holding the flashlight, and then there's that object over there, and there's a light. Okay, and, and, and we have pretty much our ordinary awareness uh, in looking at that. Now, what if, for a moment, we took the perspective not of holding the flashlight, not of the person who's holding it, but of the flashlight itself. Okay, so let's now look at that part of the chair, our eyes wide open, as the holder of the flashlight now. We're still hold, we're holding it now. We're aware of our subjective perspective on it. And all that we bring to it, it's okay, that's where we are. And now, Let's switch and just become the flashlight. Let's go back to the perspective. Let's hold that flashlight again and come back into ourselves with all of our, our subjectivities, preconceptions, whatever they are, it's okay. Look at that chair. very much aware of the holder because we're pointing that flashlight right at that point at the chair for some reason. And now let's switch and just take the point of view of the flashlight. Now that's just a little exercise that can get us out of our, out of our our context for just, for just a moment. And, and if you go back and forth, you can start to become aware of the difference in those two perspectives. And again, this is all experiential, and the object is to become aware of that difference and what that water might be the water that we bring to our perception and the water that clouds our vision. And although, of course, when we're just the flashlight, of course, we're bringing stuff to that too because, you know, we're not advanced meditators. But it's different stuff. And it gives us a little bit of perspective on what we might bring. When... Uh, in, in, you know, as I prepare for this, and, and by the way, 
you know, giving one of these talks or talk anywhere is just the greatest thing because you just learn so much because you're just scared to death that you're going to be in front of, you know, wonderful people who came there to listen and that you're going to have nothing to say, right? So that's, so that's a great thing. So, so you bring your awareness and you just come out of it and note the difference. Nietzsche called it, he called it perspectivalism. Just trying to get, just trying to get outside. So it's a little bit of a, a little bit of it. So we've seen, forget about the cat boxes. So you see like, like just how, how when you look at someone with love and compassion, that changes things. Or you think everything is just completely interrelated, right? In other words, you know, Rory is there. Rory sent me an email because she met John Paul's family. She ended up at Columbia. You know, all of these things, all these incredible connections. And, and again, you can't feel that separate. That changes your view. And now this Mahamudra, this flashlight holder, and then being the flashlight, that changes things too. Now, it can even help with relationships. Uh, we've been married 42 years, and when Jam was going to, I didn't tell her this, well, when Jam was going to Atlanta yesterday, and we were saying goodbye, and uh, all of a sudden I thought to myself, what's it like being Jan right now? Normally, I'd just be me. I'd just be thinking about whatever I'm thinking about, about her leaving, right? So, so I thought about, just for an instant, now you can feel compassion for Jan being married to such a strange guy. <laughs> um, so, so, so look, so, so this, so these, these techniques can help us now, help us not only get a, a fix on our reality, but also maybe to alter the water a little bit, change its temperature, its tincture. And uh, now, you could say, if you have faith in Buddhism, um, that's a great thing. And faith, they say faith moves mountains. And it does, because it provides incredible motivation for us to do things otherwise we might not do. So those of us who are lucky enough to have faith in some really good, uh, positive system of living, it's wonderful. Okay, but, but there are a lot of us who don't, just because we don't. So you could, uh, you could actually uh, uh, have faith in quantum mechanics then, because and most of us being materialists and worshipers of science, right, we are. So you could also say that since in quantum mechanics, uh, nothing, for instance, no particle, you can't know the position and momentum of anything without observing it. And it's only the, the observation or interaction that gives that particle a position and momentum, um, it's the same thing with when we focus our minds and our attention on our water, on ourselves. So uh, in the 70s, there's all kinds of, you know, there's a Tao of physics and you know, all that stuff, but we don't have to go all the way there, but there's a really strong connection possibly scientifically, and the scientists figure everything out, but scientifically for this basis of observation as being a deep connector. Okay, a connector of, of our holding the flashlight perspective and our being the flashlight perspective and seeing what that water is and starting to be able to maybe change the water. Now, there's a whole system of, time check, not bad, okay. There's a whole system in, in Buddhism of drastically changing our uh, very being and our approach to reality, and that is the system of Vajrayana. 
And generally, we talk in Buddhism of three vehicles. We talk about Hinayana, which the Dalai Lama calls fundamental vehicle. That's basically practiced in, in Southeast Asia. And, uh, uh, and, and the, the emphasis there is on uh, getting out of cyclic existence to, not a place, but a condition of nirvana, of extinguishing all these things that make us really miserable, right? Through the Four, four Noble Truths, meditation, etc. Then there's the Mahayana, second vehicle, great vehicle, universal vehicle, that really started to spring up in the early part of the first millennium uh, uh, and emphasize more compassion and the notion of a bodhisattva that you shouldn't just be looking for your own release from these things, but you should, like a shepherd, get everybody else across the river first, right? And then there's the Vajrayana, which, uh, according to tradition, was also preached by Buddha, which developed a little bit later, historically, we see, at the end of the first millennium, which talks about uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, meditational practices in order to actually make us a Buddha, make us into Buddhas. So with the, the, with the sole uh, desire to help others. And when I first went to Jamspal years and years and years and years ago, and we started learning, he started teaching me Tibetan, I said to him, what is Dharma? And he looked at me, thought for a minute and said, benefiting others. Right? That's the whole thing. And, and, and in the Vajrayana, of course, there's the same notion of emptiness. That is, not being overdone, not being underdone, everything being interrelated, and compassion. Um, so, but in, in the Vajrayana practice, one of the things that yogis do is they, uh, at least six times a day, will visualize their own death process. And in visualizing their own death process, they go through the different stages of first uh, the outer elements of their bodies dissolve and then the inner elements dissolve. And they end up in a state which is very much like the flashlight, which is very much like this notion of emptiness. And and complete uh, interrelation. And so, so what they'll do is, is first they'll, they'll say, okay, the, 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 they're, here I am, I'm dying, and now the, the earth element dissolves first, and then I'm like a, a shimmering, like a column of, of light, shimmering like a mirage, and then the water element dissolves, and I just see smoke because then the fire element is preponderant and the fire element dissolve and I see just sparks because what's left is just the wind element, the energy element and then that dissolves and that dissolves and, and I'm in a state of consciousness which they describe with great specificity. It's like a candle is lit at the bottom of a little hole and it's just flickering and then you go into more subtle stages they call luminance, radiance, and imminence where uh, you, uh, your more subtle instincts all dissolve. And then when those are gone, you go from a state where everything is, is black nothingness to a state of clear light transparency. And that, practicing that, after proper initiations, etc., and training, is yet another way to get some perspective on the water. Right? So it's another technique that we have in, in Buddhism. Actually, this is the letter hum in Buddhism. And when they visualize uh, the elements dissolving, the, the hum gets smaller and smaller and smaller until it's just a little tip gone like that, but it leads to a state uh, where again our water is transformed and then, and then when they come out of that state, they do it of course with a motivation just to become a Buddha 
to benefit others and help others with whatever problems they have, and, and they tap into uh, what you might call quantum mechanics, the zero point, zero point energy, and manifest as a, as a deity in a land with uh, uh, a wonderful, wonderful place, and actually then, with a lot of practice, become Buddhists. That's how you do it. So, um, so that's one. And then, and then I have to tell you, because Bob Thurman and I, we spent a, some time looking at this. Um, when you're in that clear light, transparent state, you might think to yourself, I see nothing. I know emptiness. I feel great bliss. I am clear light. And, uh, and I finally found that in one of Tsongkhapa's commentaries on... Uh, on one of the explanatory tantras, but in any, way, any event. So that's another way, and there's another, uh, Alex Berzin, who's a great, uh, uh, a great Buddhist scholar, who actually, in the beginning, there were three Americans who got into Buddhism back when, and it was Jeffrey Hopkins and Bob Thurman and Alex Berzin, the three of them. And Alex Berzin now has this great website called the Berzin Archive, which I recommend to all of you. But, but Alex Berzin wrote that in studying Buddhism, it's a lot about putting all these different things together. And they do have a tremendous amount in common and a tremendous ability to help us at whatever stage we are in the practice. So another way to look at all this is, is maybe a simpler way but it's not so simple because monks and monasteries spend years and years and years and years doing this. And that is, we normally think of that person holding the flashlight as being solid, right? Really solid, I'm here. But then, if we think about everything we've learned, that everything is so interconnected and we've known even from today, we see how just a little bit, a few seconds of mental activity can change our whole point of view and can change the water. So imagine if you had that point of view about the interconnectedness and interrelationship of everything and then apply it, then apply it to yourself as the concrete flashlight holder, you're not concrete anymore. You're porous. So what happens to that flashlight holder? That flashlight holder starts to disappear. And then you start to see a little bit of wiggle room and a little bit of freedom about how you can approach your own state of mind. Time check. You doing okay? Okay. Anybody have any questions? Any comments? Questions? Yes. So you, you sort of we have to speak about how you and Bob Thurman uh, talked about that moment when you might say, "I see nothing," or "I, I, I experience and no emptiness." Is that itself still uh, because you're thinking this, saying this, doing this, uh, just another bit of identity that's getting in the way? Yeah, absolutely. Of course, because we never, as humans, we never met anything we couldn't screw up. So, so you know, it's a great point. So, of course, any of this can become dogma. And, of course, there's always, you know, in saying this, if you say it in a grandiose way, right? I see nothing. I, right, I know emptiness. I feel great bliss. I am clear light. I mean, it's, mon it's monstrous, right? It all depends how you do it. And that's why that... That's why the prerequisites to any kind of these practices are very intense, and thank you for the question, are very intense devotion to the benefit of others as your motivation. It's not, it ain't about yourself. It's just about helping others. That's the only way you would do all this crazy stuff. And that's the only real motivation for it, so thank you. Anybody else? Okay, so... Uh, I want to talk about another little tool that I was thinking about a few years ago in terms of penetrating. Soren? Yeah. Um, it sounds like an absurd question, but I'm going to ask it. Mm -hmm. What do you do if you need a Buddha? 
Well, the Zen people say you should. <laughs> Zen people say you should shoot him. There's, there's a book called "If You See a Buddha Walking Down the Road, Shoot Him." But uh, I would just be so happy. <laughs> what? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what that's basically that's basically answering your question, and that is if you're setting up Buddha as something that's concrete and unrelated and dogmatic. Shoot that idea you have of the Buddha. Because there may be a Buddha over there, but there's an interaction with your own mind that everything is not just out there, but everything is a product of your mental interaction. That's the teaching of one of the famous mind only school of Buddhism. So, so if you meet a Buddha down the road, if walking down the road, I would be so happy. I'd be so happy. Zen people who understand more might say shoot him. But I think the message, the message is uh, not to worship idols. We find that in the Old Testament also. Okay. Um, so another way of breaking down this, uh, this kind of disconnect, I, m I mentioned that uh, uh, when I was doing research on, really on Tantra, and what is, you know, what is Tantra, and I read scholars who said, it's really power relations. You know, Foucault, Michel Foucault wrote, every, he wrote, power is everywhere. And indeed, uh, you find a lot of uh, misogyny and there's all kinds of things running through all the scriptures, all the holy scriptures of every religion. And, and a lot of it, you can read it through that lens. It's about power, right? And so, but, but yet I approach these things as as spiritual, right? So one hand, you know, they say it's about power. I say it's spiritual. And it's like this, right? It's like this. So there's no progress along the hermeneutic helix. No progress. Same thing, for example, with uh, uh, abortion. It's about the life of the fetus or baby. No, it's about a woman's right to choose, right? Like that. And you see it now in our body politic with, uh, you know, Democrats, liberals, blue state people say one thing, red state people another thing. There's not, not a connection. So it occurred to me that uh, a good little remedy for this um, was to just ask in a conversation like that, you guys know, how much? Right. In other words, okay, um, take take power structure of of Buddhism with lamas and you know in some respects a feudal society, which is the Chinese critique of Tibet, right? And but you say how much is it? And be crude about it. Take some numbers: ninety percent, eighty percent. If you're having a discussion, say about abortion. Uh, someone says, well, I don't want anyone telling me what I should do with my body. Okay, how much? Is it 100%? Because as soon as someone says anything less than 100%, then you're in a dialogue, and then you can progress up the hermeneutic helix. So I think this would be good medicine for all of us. Okay, just keep that in mind. It's another little technique for advancing along the hermeneutic helix. Now, um, I just want to finish up with a few things. Um, one is that, yeah, in my little outline here, it says the water is something we are in will start to disappear. Why is that? That is because everything in the Dhammapada, uh, which is another teaching of Buddha, it says, the first verse says, the mind comes before. The mind comes before everything. And what, what that teaches is that everything that happens out there is a product of interaction with your mind. I mean, you know it because, I mean, here we are. There's a subway out there, maybe, but if, if, 
we didn't interact with it or we didn't think about it, there wouldn't be a subway out there, right? And, and that, that, that school, and of course Buddhism, like any other religion, developed a million schools and then had lots of debates about it, you know, which is also fun and a wonderful way to sharpen everyone's mind. But in this particular school, which is called the mind-only school, the emphasis was that things are empty of being separate from mind. That there's nothing out there that's separate from mind. So, so everything that happens is a product of interaction between it and your mind, very much along the lines of quantum mechanics. Again, um, so, so this starts to act to dissolve the water a little bit because we think, we thought when we started out, we're in this water, it's around us, right? And the water kind of controls us. But now if we realize the intimate connection between our minds, which we actually witnessed when we were doing these little exercises, between our minds and the water, the water starts to dissolve. Tracy? Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. And of course, um, you know, I teach at Columbia. I'm an intellectual. I, I have an attenuated connection with my body. No, really. So, so for me, you know, I tend to be more up here. Right? You are a teacher of Alexander Technique. And so you're much more in touch with all those other things. So that, that is very powerful and by itself you know, is a testament to how much richer your experience will be and those like you than mine. And that's another great reason for us all to take care of our bodies too and to appreciate you know, not only the mind-body connection but the importance of body as well. Right? And all of these things can become little traps for us. And whenever, in the spirit of inquiry, just like your question, we start to move and question, then it opens things up. So thank you. Okay? So, um, so if the water is always connected to our mind or our bellies, right, then it can't really trap us anymore because... It's connected to us. They're one, maybe not one thing, but they're not two things. So the water is now starting to disappear. Okay? And now, um, let's go back to the flashlight one more time. Okay, let's become the flashlight. All right, pick anything and look at it, you're just the flashlight, you're not the holder of the flashlight, you're just the flashlight, there is only experience. Now, you there? Now, it doesn't exist. Gone, that doesn't exist either. Gone, it's absent. And that space, where even pure experience doesn't exist is, is not, it's not really a conceptual space. It's an absence, right? You went down, you, you had the water around you, then the water started to disappear, you become the flashlight, your pure experience, you're no longer the flashlight holder. Bam, that's gone too. That's not there. Imagine it's not there because it isn't. And, and, and this brings us back to the Heart Sutra, which says, there's, remember, there's no nose, there's no eye, there's no Four Noble Truths, there's no attainment, there's no non-attainment. And this 
is maybe the most powerful medicine for us. And Nagarjuna, the great Buddhist sage and teacher who lived in around the first century, he said, emptiness, that's the, it doesn't exist. It doesn't exist. Nothing exists. You don't exist. I don't exist. This building doesn't exist. He said, emptiness is the medicine for those with the disease of reification. Reification means making things more than they are, making everything into a thing, which we do all the time. Whatever our, whatever our, the, our problem of the moment is, it's about that, it's about that, it's about that. You get in a bad mood, right? It's about that, it's about right. So, so emptiness is the medicine, the supreme medicine for those with the, the, the disease of reification. Now there's also the disease of nihilism, right? Just like we can be too puffed up with David with a capital D, also I could also be like, I'm nothing, right? And some, we get that way sometimes too, we get depressed. You know, I'm nothing, and that's no good. It's no good either. And when we're in that space, you know, we need, we need a path and we need, we need connection and we should go there. But this concretizing things, worshiping them, making everything to, into an idol, this I think is our main problem. And that's why, and that's our disease. And that's why this cure, it doesn't exist, right? Flashlight, flashlight holder, object, it doesn't exist. Buddha, doesn't exist. David, doesn't exist. Um, let's stay with this for a minute and just put ourselves just as a cure to our overdoing things. Let's take a few seconds and just be, nothing exists. Now let's take it a little further. Now, of course, nothing exists, but at the same time, something's going on here. <laughs> what would it be? Right? If nothing, none of this exists, then, then what's like that? What's like that? A mirage is like that. A reflection is like that. Right? Or a, a magician's trick, an illusionist, making something appear to us, but it's really not there. And indeed, the Buddhists say that things conventionally exist, but they exist like illusion. Not as illusion, not that they're not there, but they're kind of like an illusion. They're like that reflection or magician's trick. And the way they exist, Shantarakshita, a great Buddhist scholar, he said they exist uh, and they are beautiful without examination. This is his definition of what we call conventional truths, of the two truths of ultimate truth being emptiness, things don't exist, and conventional truth, well, yeah, they do exist, but they exist like illusion. Um, and, and indeed, if things exist in this kind of playful way, right? And we know from the exercise we've gone through that how we can completely change the character of our interaction with things. We just do it a did a little bit tonight. Right? Can you imagine if you really had good teachers and, and good attention, how much you could change? And then um, everything comes back but it's not overdone, and it's playful, and it's interactive. And part of the Vajrayana approach to that is that it's all ecstatic, right? There's nothing to drag you down about any of this. You look at any of you, you're all gods and goddesses. And that's why you could look at this as teaching, foam core. You could also look at it as ecstasy, just pure 
ecstasy. It's a nice way to power yourself to enlightenment. But of course, even that ecstasy does not exist. Because we're so ready to grab it. I want it. I want to capture it. I want to put it in my cat carrier. Okay? <laughs> so, so and, and, and there are really three ways to look at the water. And the three ways are we could look at the water, which David Forster Wallace talked about, as really existing, right? We did that when we started. As really not existing, that's number two. That's when number one is really existing. Number two is really not existing. And that gives rise to like a space-like zone, right? It doesn't exist. Everything is just spacious. Or three, it's just water. We don't think about whether it exists or it doesn't exist, right? Just our kind of ordinary way of thinking. Now, people like us, we can perceive one and three. That is, we can perceive the water, my thing, my hang-up, my life, my relationships, whatever it is, as really existing. And we can go through life thinking, not thinking about one way or another. We can do that. But the definition of Buddha is a Buddha can think all three ways at the same time. Things really exist, they really don't exist, and the Buddha can just, you know, uh, you know, chug one down and not think about it. <laughs> um, but we're not Buddhas yet, okay? We're just beginners, so we take all this in little doses with baby steps. Nagarjuna said that emptiness, this whole notion that things don't exist, good medicine for us, but he says it's like a snake. You've got to handle it in the right way or it's going to bite you. Um, um, so let's, let's take a middle approach to this. And, uh, but knowing that we spend most of our time making things into idols and taking them as too real, uh, let's remember that they don't exist. The end. <laughs> Thank you. This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit tibethouse.us. Thanks for watching. Tashi Delek.